You know, we're in chapter 2 of Song of Solomon tonight, and I'm, I'm going to continue uh, with the same pattern we did last time. Rather than read this whole thing through, by the whole chapter, we're going to go kind of read it through and then kind of stop here and there. I've got like four themes, or four verses that we'll kind of concentrate on tonight. I simply wanted to preface our remarks today by saying that uh, feel free to butt in at any time. Um, this is rather dense material, and I could definitely talk for hours, um, even in my ignorance, about every chapter, because it's just so dense. So we're not going to go through it this verse by verse because we wouldn't get very far. And um, time is, you know, something that is a little bit pressing in these things. So we will simply whet our appetites, I guess you could say, with the glories of the person of Christ. I think tonight there's it's particularly poignant, and you'll see, I think, as we go through some of the verses that we highlight, that the Lord is really able to provide everything we need. We never think of it that way. I think we're so transitory bound that we have a, have a hard time really kind of getting outside of ourselves and our earthly needs and our earthly life to understand what the great ascetics understood, that Christ really can be all. And in finding that place in your heart to allow him to become all, you're truly fulfilled. And so our our problem, like we spoke about last week in the sermon, is that the distance from Christ brings darkness, right? And so we're we're so encapsulated with darkness in in our our entire life that we lead so often that it's hard for us to imagine how good the light really is. And when we speak tonight about wounded by love, I think that's particularly the verse that, 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 that to me, sticks in my heart from chapter 2 of the Song of Solomon. But um, suffice it to say, we'll go through here and take a, take a few a few verses and kind of amplify them. And uh, there's there's more that could be said, certainly. Um, uh, my brain's a pea when it comes to these things. It's small. You know, peas are small. Um, even though my head may be big, my brain's small. And um, so uh, I, I apologize for that. But what we do touch on, hopefully God will, will bless. So he starts off by saying these great words. And... Remember, this is called a song, so it could be sung. You could, I could write a song about this, maybe. I, I, I think people have. I mean, I think about that verse 4. Uh, isn't there a song? The Protestants have a little song. It's like a children's song about his banqueting house, his love, or something like that. I don't remember how it goes. But um, some of these verses could really make a good song. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As a lily among thorns, so is my love, so is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood. So is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. There's, I'm going to read maybe a little bit more tonight than I normally do from the fathers, because this is, is what, the way they put these things is so good that uh, I kind of, I'm going to laugh. I'm not, this is not doctrinal tonight, really, so much as it is um, sensibility, I guess bring us to our sensibilities and have, have us understand truly what uh, the Lord is all about. He's, he compares himself. He says, I'm a rose of Sharon. St. Ambrose said this. He said, St. Mary is the rod, and Christ is the blossom of St. Mary, who spreads the sweet aroma of faith in the whole world. So you think of a rose, right? We think of a rose, we think of the fragrance, right? Why do women like roses, girls? Tell me. They smell good. They're just a perfect smell. Is that it? It's the yeah. smell, it's they the aroma? Too. They're, they're, they're out in June. Sort of, it's like one of the first major flowers that okay. comes to the garden. And then they're constant also. They're so beautiful, they're almost velvety. Right. Yeah, so but is, is, it, is, it the, is it the aroma? I mean, are we, are we saying that we have a consensus about the aroma being the first thing you think of? But why they're you'd like it when somebody gives you a bunch of roses? They're hard to get to because they have thorns and you have to get up to the first place. Oh, there you go. That's, that's getting, getting into the deep things there, the deeper things of God, right? So he says he's, he says he's like a rose. So St. Ambrose says that he appeared as a blossom in the virgin's womb. That's an interesting concept, that Christ even in the womb was a blossom. Flowering forth, just think of the blossoms as they open up. And so in the womb he was, he was, he was thought to be, by the fathers, a blossom. How much more so when he came out as a babe and lived among us, and then when he came to the fullness of of his earthly life, and he was crucified for us. We'll get into that a little tonight about the blood and the wounds and all these things. But this is a beautiful image that he was like a blossom in the virgin's womb. And he said about himself, this is still Ambrose going on, 
I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. When you pluck a flower, it keeps its smell. And when it's crushed or cut in pieces, it smells even more. That's true, too. Especially with roses, I think. In the same manner, when the Lord Jesus was hung on the cross, he did not fail when bruised, nor weaken when being torn. Now, you think so? If we, you know, we, we tear something up, usually it's not, you know, it's gone, right? But in being torn, and he actually had thorns on his head, right? And they were piercing his, and there was blood. He was whipped, he was beaten, he was pierced with a spear. All these things didn't diminish him, but they actually increased his work. And so it says that he, when he hung on the cross, he, he didn't fail when being bruised, nor weaken when being torn. We're going to come back to this a little bit when we talk about wounded by love, too, I think. When pierced with a spear, he became more handsome with the blood that shed from him and carried a new beauty. He cannot die spiritually, but grants the dead the gift of eternal life. The Holy Spirit has descended on this rose, which blossomed in the royal rod. <clears throat> so writes St. Ambrose. Now, <clears throat> when we think of roses from now on, we need to think about Christ. And I think that one of the really important things about this book for us is that some of these images need to stay in our mind. I don't want to be like a clanging gong in a, in a, in a loud symbol that says in, in the New Testament. But tonight I want to just try to leave us with a few phrases that are divine phrases and that are deep phrases. If you just read this verse, that I am the rose, I am the lily, you probably go in one ear and out the other. But God wants us to think of him. Every word is important. And so he wants us to think of him as a rose. Now, not too long ago, we were talking about the kind of the, uh, the meaning of things, right? The logos, the logo, the reasons for things. When we think about roses from now, you can connect them to Christ going forward in your life. So here, here's, this, here's the situation. This rose, this, this rose of Sharon is our beloved, and we're his bride, right? And everything about his life is sanctifying like a sweet scent sanctifies a room, right? Maybe that's why you like roses, right? Because they're not just like in this one little place influencing what goes on, but they influence the whole room. Visually, they become a centerpiece of attraction, right? And when you smell them, you don't have to get right next to them, although that's really fun to do. But you can smell them all over the room. Mm -hmm. And so this is the analogy that God gives himself. He calls himself a rose, right? And so we need to think of him like this rose. And hopefully when you think about roses in the future, it'll connect you to the Lord and his work and how you're his bride. You're, you're married to a rose, right? You are to be one with a rose. And, of course, by uh, implication, you're supposed to be like the rose. And so all this idea of the scent, I think particularly we can get, latch on to for tonight, all the idea of the scent permeating everything around it, this is what Jesus does as the rose. He permeates our hearts, our lives. Everything is different because he's around. It's like light. But it's to the nostrils, if you will. But it's really light to the heart. Right? And so when we think of this rose of Sharon from now on, we think differently about it. How he is smelled by all. And like the apostle said, he says to some he's a sweet savor of life unto life, and to others he's a scent of death unto death. Yeah. Did I miss it, or did you just say, what's Sharon? The Rose of Sharon. Rose of Sharon. And so it's a place in, in, in the Holy Land, where so it's connecting Jesus to a place where he says he's the Rose of Sharon. Sharon was a valley. It's a beautiful valley. I've not oh, been there. I Has anybody been there, Dad? Have you been to Sharon? There is a plant called Rose of Sharon. Not knowingly. Yeah. No. There, is a, there is a Rose of Sharon. You've been there? No, but there's, that's what it's called. There's a Rose of Sharon. Yeah. Rose of Sharon. No, I want to go. Yeah. I've never been to Jerusalem, and I'd like to go very much to Israel. All right. So it's this, worth it. Yeah. On the list. <laughs> so we have this, we have this um, kind of opening verse. That he's the Rose of Sharon. And then it says he's a lily. 
So we'll go from one flower to another. I like lilies. I wrote a song one time called Consider the Lilies. Maybe some of you have heard it. I have it. It was, I, I saw the lilies coming up out of the snow on May 12th, I think it was. And I was inspired to think about it, to consider the lilies, how they grow. Oh, yeah. They toil not, they spin not, but I say unto you that Solomon, in all his glory, wasn't arrayed like one of these. Mm-hmm. Now, I think that we could say, safely say that, that Solomon was arrayed pretty fancily, and maybe it's a stretch in one sense to say that the lilies more adorned than Solomon. Because, I mean... When the queen of Sheba came to see Solomon, she, uh, she said, uh, you know, the half of it wasn't told me. <laughs> How great this is. You know, and ascending up to his, his throne with the lions on each side, the ivory throne, and here he's sitting there and all the gold and the, the servants and, the, you know, the whole thing. It was like being in a great <coughs> cathedral, you know, except the whole empire was tribute to him. Solomon it was truly like arrayed greatly in the earthly sense. But the lily... When we take the lily and think about the lily as a flower, and we connect the lily to Christ, then we can see how he was he was greater than Solomon, right? Certainly. I mean, there's no doubt about that in our minds. So we strip away the glory of the earthly and the temporal and the transitory, and we think about what the lily is all about. And, and when we connect him to Christ, then we see something same different. So I'm going to read a few quotes about the this here, too, and I've got a few more on this one. So... Regarding lilies, um, first thing I should say about a lily is, have you ever seen a lily? Yeah. Who, who knows what a lily is? Everybody, right? I, mean, I know Johan, you know what they are. Everybody knows what a lily is, right? Do you know what a lily is? Do you know how they grow, right? They get, they're, they're real tall, like, right? There are some short ones too, I think, but uh, generally speaking, the lilies, I think that they're talking about is long. It's tall. Like, they're like three feet tall, and they, they come up out of the ground, like, and they tower up over the ground, so they kinda, they're kind of lifted up, right? So that they're above the ground, the earth, right? Mm-hmm. And that flower that blossoms at the top of this like, long, skinny stem. It's interesting, because as soon as the lily flower is gone and everything dries up, all you have is this little stem left, and these little mm-hmm. stems, and they stay there. You can pull them out. And I, like, I always like to do that, because when you pull them out, they come out of the rest. Have you ever done that? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> the stem separates easily from the, the ground part. You know, when, when you pull it out, it's like, it's like it's loose in there. And the lily was attached to that. Well, anyway, until they rise way up, but he says that he says it like a lily, and he connects lilies to the thorns too. Now I don't usually see lilies around thorns, but apparently they can grow that way. And it's a lily of the valley that's like brown color. No, this is this is not what they're talking that's about. No. And the fathers ta- the fathers made it very clear they're talking about the lilies that go up like the ones we're used to. Okay. The ones that we have in our house. The ones that, the ones that are three feet high. Like who we got up in our house like those. Yeah. And uh, what, what they say that the the, the 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 Lord wants to connect this lily idea to the thorns. And he says, so I'm, I'm like a lily among thorns. So we've got this idea of a lily among thorns. So here's what some of the fathers said. St. Gregory Anissa says, the soul is like a lily. Ascending to the Messiah, her true vine dresser, she rises above the cares of this life, the thorns of sin that choke the soul, and the dirt of this life, so she may become undefiled. In the eyes of God, the believer is like a gorgeous flower which even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of them. She is beautiful, not because of her self-righteousness, but due to the grace of the blood that flows inside of her. Although man accepted the thorns of sin, God still sees him as a lily. He descends to him and passes through the thorns to remove the curse from him. When the beloved says, like a lily among the thorns, he means that if she wants to be adorned with virtues, she must endure the sufferings of the thorns very cautiously. And additionally, St. Ambrose said this, Virtues are surrounded with the thorns of spiritual evil, and no one can gather the fruits unless he approaches with caution. And lastly, another father said, We see here a, a true picture with the lilies among the thorns of the church that is surrounded by heresies and heretics who unsuccessfully attempt to destroy the church. So, when we think about lilies among the thorns, and maybe God wants us to start thinking about lilies among the thorns. So we're like these lilies among the thorns. Right? Now, of course, if we're like Christ, he's like a lily too. But he has this connection between thorns and lilies for a purpose. And so we just read some of the things that the fathers say about this. Now, thorns are 
not fun. Does anybody like thorns? I, I, I hate them. I, what I hate is I, I hate those ones that are in grass. They're, they're like, um, they're like nettles. Those, oh, yeah. Yeah. Nettles. yeah. And um, so I, I used to go out and get them wherever I could find them. And they, yeah, even, at, even at Peruvian Link, they've got them in the field. I go out there and cut them down. That's how bad I am. You can eat them. Yeah, I know you can. Um, but we want we need to have this connection about thorns. We need to have this connection about thorns and lilies. That we're like the lily, and there's a lot of things around us that are like thorns, right? And we have to rise up like the lily rises up from out among the thorns. The thorns are everything that seeks to spike you, right? To slow you in your growth. And there's another passage that we'll hit in a little bit here that says pretty much the same thing a different way. But thorns are, are around us everywhere. And we're, we're, we're still among them right now. Just because you're sitting in this Bible study and you came to Vespers tonight doesn't mean the thorns have left your life. So I guarantee the second you go out of here and being with all these perfect people in this room, <laughs> things will be different, right, when you go outside. Or you go home and everything falls apart or whatever, the kids are sick or whatever. So we've got all these thorns. We have to learn how to deal with them. But we can't deal with them if we're at the same level they are. When I was thinking about this, I thought about the fact that the lily prospers just like it does because it's it's not still down amongst the thorns. It's, it's rising above them. And we have to find a way to nurture our souls so that our true lily can come out. Right? So we can be the lily and not be mired in the thorns and be overcome them. Of course, the Lord had the parable of the sower, right? He tell, told us the same thing in a different way, right? There's the seed, the sower goes out, which is the Lord, and he spreads the word and it lands in different places and things happen. So our, you know, about the only thing we can do he sows the seed, right? So we, we're not sowing the seed so much. But we can have some effect on what kind of ground we are. And we can, we can be weed in our garden. We can be paying attention to our life. And uh, if we want to be a strong lily, we've got to get up. We've got we to we rise up towards, towards the light, towards God. So the last uh, one I wanted to go over this since the beginning here is, is the apple tree. Because it, uh, it speaks about uh, an apple tree in verse 3. It says, an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sun's I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. And he brought me to his banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Stay me with flagons with little cakes like raisins. Comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. Let's leave the love sick off for a minute. We'll get to that in a minute. Let's just talk about the apples for a minute. So Jesus compares himself to an apple tree. And... He wants us to sit in the shade of it. We have great delight when we're sitting in the shade. It's like being a lily that's rising up to see the light. We're getting the light. We, we enjoy the light. We can feel the light. It's good. It nourishes us. We grow. We get stronger. We like the light. Then when we see darkness, we don't like darkness. If we sit under the shade of the apple tree, we're peaceful also. But why did he compare himself to an apple tree? When you hear about apples, what do you think of when you're thinking about Scripture? Clean. No. No, way back. Go way back. Yeah, right. There you go, right? The idea. Didn't you do, you do some sort of painting with apples? Didn't you have something with apples in one of your paintings I just saw? Somewhere? Probably. Yeah. So, so when you think about apples, you think, oh, well, yeah, these apples are bad. <laughs> you know, you, didn't Eve eat an apple? No. <laughs> but what he's doing is he's setting apart himself the apple is like a symbol of, of incarnation. It's like the opposite of the, the tree that they ate of, which was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's interesting, too, that there's no commandment not to eat of the tree of life, but that God removed them before they could eat it after they sinned. But anyway, so what Christ is doing is he's setting himself up, and I'll read what one of the fathers said. We're like an apple tree among the trees of the woods. So is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade and lifted since she lives among the thorns and cannot rise to him, she just, he descends to her and becomes like an apple tree. He dwelt among us, we the fruitless trees, and became like one of us. He wasn't fruitless like us, but became as the beautiful, sweet-smelling apple. Its fruit is eaten, and its juice is drunk. And what's that tell you? Yeah, that's your little bit of liturgical theology there, brother. Right? See that? There's a drinking and the eating there? Both. It's the tree of life from which we pick instead of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. 
Truly the earth is dried up because we ate from the tree of disobedience. The beloved, the obedient son, came from among the thorns, passing through our obedience and carried the curse of the thorns so that we may sit at his feet, nesting in the shade of his cross, wood, and of his love among the tribulations of this world. My friends, there's a lot of trees to eat from this world. You can eat off cherry trees. I stumped my kids with that one this week. People were trying to guess words, and I, I picked cherry. Nobody guessed cherry. They finally all gave up. No, Sim, so, so, up. so obviously. You just ran out of time. Yeah. And so um, there's all kinds of trees to eat from. But metaphorically, there's a lot of places you can eat from, too. We want to eat a lot of trees. I don't know about you, but I, I, I have... I, I, I have a lot of, a lot of things I, I, I like to eat of, you know, spiritually speaking, right? or al allegorically speaking. But do I really like to eat from Christ, the tree of Christ? That's really the challenge, is to, to enjoy his fruit and to concentrate <clears throat> on it when you're eating it and enjoying it and appreciating it. Sometimes we're eating it from the tree we don't appreciate it. I don't know if you ever experienced that. Like you're in a really blessed place and you take it for granted? You ever done that? <laughs> you ever taken some situation that was really great for granted and then lost it? Right? I think that's how Adam and Eve kind of really felt when they went out of the garden and they looked back and saw this, the, the gateway guarded by the <clears throat> angels, the fiery angels. They weren't thinking about how great the tree was that they ate of. They are thinking about the one they didn't eat of. <laughs> Why did we do this? This is us. This is what we do. We have the tree to eat from, and we just, we just ignore it, or we don't eat it, we don't enjoy it, we, we don't appreciate it. And then when it's gone, it's too late. So God's calling us to, to this apple tree. He wants us to think of him as an apple tree. So next time you prune your apples or eat an apple, think of this as the the tree of life that we're eating from. Jesus calls himself an apple tree, so he wants us to eat that apple. He wants us to partake of it. He wants us to enjoy everything about it. Being in its shade, looking at its leaves. How about blossoms of apples? I don't know if they smell much. My nose isn't the best. Do apple blossoms smell? Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's, awesome. it's a really unique really? fruit, too. Okay. So, so there's and a lot of good things about the apples. The center of the apple, really cut weird. it open, has a star. Yes, mm -hmm. I, that yeah. I do know. Yeah. star. <laughs> Takes so, a long time so there's a lot of things about the apple. So you see, you, you, you see in the appreciation of the apple how looking at it and studying it and meditating on it draws you even more to it. And this is what I think uh, it is I take away from this, these first few verses about the lily, the, the uh, rose, and especially the apple tree. And I'm called to this, to understand the true beauty of this, intellectually, in faith, and then I'm supposed to drive towards experiencing it so that I can be... Like these great monks, these great monastics, these great saints in the world, these great kings, whoever, Christians, be a great Christian because I'm living in Christ. I'm attracted to him. He's a rose. He's a lily. He's not in the thorns. He's above the thorns. He came for us. and he, He's like an apple tree. All these things, this is what he is. Do we think of God that way? I think not. It says that he brought us to the banqueting house. And his banner over us is love. This is a picture of the heavenly life. Even, I would say, in this world. <clears throat> because it speaks about later, later in this chapter about the resurrections, and the first resurrection particularly. But here, he wants us to concentrate on the fact that you have the opportunity now, with your rose of Sharon, with your lily, with your apple in hand, to be in the banqueting house. Where the banner over you, the flag, if you will, the covering over us, is like, think of communion when I have the air over the communion. It's waving over. This is the banner that waves over the presence of Christ, where Christ sits, is truly love. And so, as we enter this banqueting house, and we're, we're appreciating all these things about the apples and the, all these, the beauty the glories of God, how much love there is in him. We think of being in his presence as being like surrounded by, enveloped by, protected by, shielded by, immersed in love. That's very good imaging. It's a banner over me. 
It was love. It wasn't war. It wasn't power. Wealth. Long life. Happiness. Whatever we might think of. It's love, which is greater than all those things, by far. This is, this is what his presence is like. This is the, this is the, the wedding feast in a, in a picture, in a way, of how good it is, how sweet it is. And again, he feeds us with apples in this, uh, this little banqueting house. This banquet is like the new life in Christ that we have. If we could just taste briefly of the beauty of that apple tree, we'd enter into a little bit, just a little bit, of the glory of God. And it would change us. Perhaps you've had times in your life where you've been changed by God. By being in His presence, seeing His banner over you, truly His love. It's really, for me, it's, it's happened several times. I always kind of regress again because like, I don't appreciate, like I just said earlier, all the, how really good it is. Maybe my faith weak. Or I love the world too much. Probably all those things. But this banqueting house is a place of feasting. And it's a place of wisdom. In the presence of the king, there's not just this kind of like this feeling and fact of love, if you will. There's also wisdom. If any man seeks a wisdom, you've got to go to God. You want to know how to live your life, how to make decisions, how to figure out which way to go, which job to take, which woman to marry, which one to run from. <laughs> <laughs> Could be said about men too, ladies. I'm not, you, know. <laughs> you know, all these things, and you need wisdom, and you gotta, you gotta be where God is to get it. You gotta come to Him. And I guess we've kind of said enough for the moment about the glories of God. And so, the question really came to me, and maybe it will come to you too: is how do I make this jump from being I don't know, so unappreciative, first of all, I would say, at one level of God. So out of love with God, and so in love with the world. How do I make the leap from my very worldly life to this spiritual place where I'm like dwelling with God, laying on his bosom in the banqueting house? How do we, how do, we do that? Anybody got any idea before I talk about what I see here? How do we... How do we get there? Trust him. Okay. What are you praying for when you pray? Wisdom. The health of his brothers and sisters. It says right there. Christ's presence. What was that, brother? Just to be in Christ's presence. I think that's what all the prayers kind of get at. The praying itself brings you into the presence in a way. Well, if you can. And the prayers are directed towards that too. Always, so you're not necessarily you're saying technique. you're not necessarily saying to pray for this experience. You're just saying that prayer itself is the experience in a way, and it will it will by itself yeah. bring you there. Yes. Keep praying. When you enter the house, I want you to come and see me. That's very powerful because you will. What other comments do we have about this? I mean, how do we? How, how would you think? I mean, it, so here you sit in your chair as you are right now. I sit in mine. How we just sung out the we sung in a way in our hearts and our souls about you're lifted up by the glories of God. He's a rose. He's a lily. He's an apple. He's great. all these great things. I want to be there. I want to be where the banqueting house is. Love banners over me, fluttering. I can see the glories of Jesus and me. And the world is all at peace. How do I get there? Because my life is so different than that. Gratitude, singing in church. That's one way, yeah. yeah. But sacramentally, you're there every divine liturgy. Every divine liturgy. You are sacramentally there, but in your soul... You, you enter the banquet yeah. hall. Mm -hmm. You do. Very much so. So this is like a means to yeah. experience and, I, and get this grace that would transport Yeah, I would say from, us. from that perspective, it's not so much what I do, because it's there's nothing that I do, um, selfishly speaking, that brings me closer to God, but... The grace of God working through me mm -hmm. that allows for that end to be attained, and so I would say, uh, from from this standpoint, the grace of of the Holy Eucharist is the food that fuels 
the flame, so to speak, or or one of those sacramental fuels. You have the sacramental grace of confession and and. You know, I think one of the things that, 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 that one of the fathers wrote here is on, on where it says "stay me with flags." That means it's kind of like you're asking for flagons and for apples, which they said was a picture of the Holy Communion, yeah. to be fed by Christ directly, and with His life, because He's a tree of life. And so there's this, they see this connection in, in this verse also again. I guess point point being is that we shouldn't um, shouldn't take God out of the equation in terms of how we get to God, if that makes sense. Well, we, we certainly can. Okay, so like uh, so we've heard a few brothers and sisters say about how they're going to move. How are you going to move? I, hear, I need to hear some more ideas. How are you going to move from your your stayed life to this place of like eternal glory with God prayer and fasting. Or you, excuse me prayer and fasting prayer and fasting Do you're with Joel stuff. except you're going to fast too okay <laughs> <laughs> think you might make it faster than him because <laughs> there is something to be about prayer and fasting right Jesus said hey that takes you to a higher level this kind doesn't come out with, except by prayer and fasting not just by prayer not just by fasting you need both yeah, so this is a hard one we want to get to the bank now so maybe we need to pray and fast ourselves Okay. Well, that's fasting in a way, isn't it? But you know, it's it's also not sinning, right? Mm -hmm. Living for other people. That's love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're living in love, then. So you're gonna work like crazy to okay. okay. help other people. <laughs> that's my wife. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm not. I'm, all these are good. So I'll tell you just a minute when we get done. So we, there's more. Like, keep going. Everybody should have something to add. No, something. no matter how... How are you going to move? I mean, you know? say I can become grateful on a regular schedule, like once a week. But I'll always slide back to ungratefulness again. I mean, I'll always lose it. Got a lot of inertia. <laughs> I wonder if one of our problems, we've never really been there yet. Yeah. Little it's like when St. Simeon had this vision of light as a 19-year-old when he first went to the monastery. St. Timothy the Theologian. He really, like, wow, it was like something supernatural. It wasn't like what we experienced. Like, our, our, maybe our high points are like this high, and his was way, way up here. He spent 27 years getting back to that same place. That's how important it was to get there. So, our problem is that we've never really there. seen enough of God's work to get excited enough to do whatever it takes to get out of our seat and get to. We're kind of numb. It's apathy is the word. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good observation. Because apathy, I think, and you know, the laziness that's behind it, the doldrums and even the despondency and all these things, like, and depression, all these things that come together with that um, are fatal to so many of us. It's Greek means without emotion. Yeah, it does. Ah. Without, without pathos. Yeah. Ah. yeah. So we have this... Uh, this idea thrown in here that uh, we need to we need to we need to have God do something to, to enliven us. That's something we could pray and fast for. Okay, mm -hmm. Catherine, what about you? How are you going to get there? <coughs> um, well, I love to go for walks. And it's quiet and just stare at the light hitting the trees. And I like to say prayers while I do it. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of like the, the person that's out there observing the roses and the lilies in the valley. You're smelling the flowers. Yeah, I, stop, I stop thinking. You know, I just... It's like wordless prayer. Mm -hmm. That is, um, as we know, patristically, I have not yet experienced it, I'm sure. If I have, it was by accident. Um, that wordless prayer is way beyond our prayers that we say with words. When we pray like in church, we're at a, very, a, lo a relatively low level of prayer, but it's it's so it's still a great place to be compared to not being there. You know what I mean? But like the idea of being like in wordless prayer, where you just kind of sense God's with you and His communion, and you see like all these inputs coming in, like through an eye that's attuned to see them spiritually. That is a great way to start to say to yourself, "If I behold this, imagine what's beyond that." Does that draw you? That's enticing. Makes you want to get to the banqueting house more when you look around you and you 
can see what the God is like that's behind this. Whoever made this, the glory that must exist where he really is, where I can really see him, how great that would be. Benjamin. Yes. Tell me how you're going to get there. Oh, okay. You know well, what does St. Gregory Paul Mass say? Fasting, prayer, and then one thing that has been mentioned is vigil, and then of course unceasing prayer mm -hmm. would be the main things. The ascetic method. Okay. What are you going to do, Dad? Well, I tell you what I've been doing this past year since my wife passed away. Um, I've concentrated on how to get closer to the Lord. And every minute that I've spent since then has helped me because I ask him every day to give me the wisdom to see how to get closer to him. That's it. And it's working. It's, it's kind of like what Catherine does, it's except working. you're doing it in your armchair instead of walking through the woods. <laughs> So that when you're 94, you can't walk through the woods as much and smell the flowers as much, but you can see them in your mind more. <laughs> okay. Well, so that, this brings us to, with all these said, all, everything we just said is really true. It's, there's nothing that could be said better than what we just said in so many ways. But there's a, there's a little key here to something, and we've alluded to it in so many ways. First, we have to be in the way, right? to be where God can, can connect with us, right? And the, the phrase that they, they used for some reason, the angels in heaven who guided it to Solomon to write it and the Holy Spirit and the Lord was up there whispering in his ear, however it came about. He wrote to him this, he said, stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples. He's drawn us into the idea of communion, banqueting, for I'm sick of love. The idea of being love sick. And we could keep going and reading some more. And maybe we will, and we're going to come back to this. Let's read, read some more of the chapter. So I want you to think about being sick of love. What does that mean? What does that mean? And why is it important? So I think it's got actually almost the center portion, portion of this here. I think I'm just thinking of one more thing that would help us with this. There's so many distractions in life. And when Dad's sitting in his armchair alone, there's no distraction. When you're out walking in the woods, right. looking at the trees, you focus on that, you know, the distraction. Mm -hmm. So we have to choose to not to go in, into a quiet place where we're not right. distracted by the world, by phones ringing, by radios, by all this kind of stuff. It's mm -hmm. um, I would, I would, before I read, I'm going to read a few verses, but I want to read something out of Isaiah for you. It's amazing when you... Um, patristically and go into analysis of this chapter that um, like I've said many times every word of scripture is important but um, the fathers almost without exception when they got this idea about being wounded by love or wounded with love or love sick or they, they put it a lot of different ways but uh, I mean what it says here is I'm sick of love sick from love I guess you could say sick of love what does that mean they all went to Isaiah chapter 49, and it said, it says here this, and I'll, I'll just read it quickly, because, you know, in our own weakness, we'd never draw this connection, but when you see it, then you start realizing, oh yeah, okay. So this idea of being wounded by love. It says this in Isaiah 49, chapter, chapter 49, verse 2. He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me. He has made me a polished shaft, and his quiver hath he hid me. And then he says, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But the fathers all connect this, these, this little passage. Being made like a sharp sword, and like an arrow, like a quivered arrow, to Christ. That Christ is like the arrow. And they say that he shot through the dimness of eternity at the cross and opened up the heavens to mankind. So there's this connection like the, the arrow being like the cross sticks up in history and kind of punctures the the atmosphere of the living world and um, wakes up everybody and, and, and pierces into the world. This, this cross, this arrow, that Christ is an arrow. And so what they say is that, that Christ wounds us. He does this himself. He brings it about. 
And all those things that we do are like, I guess you could say, tilling the, 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 the soil to put us in a position where we can be wounded, where our hearts are open to being wounded. But the idea is that he's like an arrow. And he wounds us. <clears throat> now, I really thought about this a lot. What does it mean to be wounded? What is it about a wound? Well, if you think about it this way, if I open your skin up with a wound, I can go in and fix you, right? Because like, that's what surgeons do. They wound you. Then they fix you, right? That's what my son's doing today. Right now, he's, he's, he's not there right now, but he'll be there in the morning. He was there today. But they wound people to heal them. But it's also the idea that something that was impenetrable became was penetrated. And something's different because of that. And the way I kind of got a hold of this in my own heart is that just as like sin is a wound, and it leaves scars, right? And it wounds you. And once you're wounded by sin, you're more likely to do it again, right? That's why innocence is so good, right? It's great to be innocent. But when I'm wounded by some sort of sin because of somebody around me or whatever, that sin's got a hold of me and it draws me to do it more and more. Now, in a, in, in this, in a similar, to a similar result, I would say, but for the opposite end, God seeks to wound you and he will wound you. He seeks to wound, to, to wound you, to open you up to Him. And that, just like the sin wants to envelop you, He wants to envelop you. He wants you to be at the banqueting house. He wants you to be full-time Christian, not Sunday morning only. And so he's, he, he, he seeks to wound you, to make you bleed. And when He opens you up to Himself, we get a taste of like what, what He's like. And we want more and more and more, just like we wanted more sin before. Now we're wounded in a different way. Our hearts are opened to him. So, let's read a few things about what the fathers say about this here. Okay. First it says this, Being the word of God, he's a polished arrow, concealed within the shadows and the symbols, until the fulfillment of time to proclaim himself through the cross as an arrow, shot against the devil and his hosts. And having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. That's a quote from Colossians. He's the arrow, the killer of evil, the grantor of wounds of divine love for the believing souls that cry out. That's what we're doing in our prayer, right? Saying, I am wounded with love. The harrowhead is the faith that binds the shooter of the arrow, Christ, to those shot by it. As though the soul is exalted up by divine lifts to behold within her the sweet arrow of love, wounding her. How nice is the wound, how sweet is its pain. By it, life pierces the soul. So we're opened up to life, to eternal life. St. Gregory Nyssa said this, said, can anyone behold the numerous divine wounds of love, like those in Song of Solomon 2, verse 5? Who can behold the arrow that wounds numerous souls with the love of God? And this is lastly this here. If somebody is wounded by the shaft of knowledge, by the polished arrow, worthy of every love, they begin to yearn for this every day, day and night, unable to speak or to think of anything else, to desire or hope for anything else. That's when we can say our soul has truly been wounded by love. When that wound, that, that opening up, has put the Holy Spirit into a, into a place where we can say, I don't want to speak about anything else, I don't want to talk about anything else. I don't want to be anywhere else. I don't want to desire or hope for anything else. I just want to, for me to live like Paul said, as Christ. Obviously, we are somewhere on this great spectrum of being wounded by love and being hardened against it. All of us are. I mean, I think honestly, for this chapter, I could stop right here and maybe I will. Because if we could get this concept that we need to be wounded by love down, we do well. And I think like what you started saying, Joel, is how we pray, we fast and pray. We realize that apathy is our enemy. We smell the roses. We sit in our chair and think about God. We do all these things. That opens us up, up to where God can wound us, but He's the one that wounds us. It's a supernatural thing, the wounding. And I think that in our prayers, if we could be cogent to pray for this, we'd do well. If we had the whole church praying, each for ourselves and for those around us, we'd be wounded by love. 
Imagine if God would wound us all. How precious that would be. To be wounded by love. To say here, like St. Gregory says, we're wounded by, sha- by the shaft of this knowledge of love of God. We're wounded by it. We want to yearn for it day and night. We want not to speak of anything else, or desire anything else, or hope even for <coughs> anything else. But then we'd say, I've been wounded by love when I'm there. And I think that this is a supernatural thing. And I think St. Simeon realized that when he spoke of his conversion experience and his, his seeing the divine light, the uncreated light, early in life, and how he yearned to get back to that same place. It was so overwhelmingly powerful and beautiful and great. It was like the most amazing walk you could ever go on. It was like all of a sudden in his regular walk, he walked through a doorway into the light. And he never wanted to come back out. He came out and it was hard to get back in there. But he wanted to. And that's what the yearning was. That's where that wound left him in a place where he wanted nothing else but that again. And I think in every example where you can see the uncreated light of Tabor descending, you get this sense. And um, the, uh, the idea, I think, is well expressed by this. Remember when Peter was on the mountain with Christ in the transfiguration, right? And he saw the uncreated light. He was in the presence of God. Forget about all your thoughts, your actions, and everything else. He was there. He didn't do anything really to get there except to walk up the mountain, and that was great. But I mean, but he got this vision. And what did he say? Did he want to leave? It's good for us to be here. Yeah. <laughs> that was so simple, but it's so profound. It's good. This is everything. That's a that's somebody wounded by love. That's somebody who's in the banqueting house right there. The banner was love. It was supernatural. It was beyond human experience, truly. It was the uncreated light, the presence of the Holy God, in somewhat more of his glory, as much as they could bear, as the trope part says, they saw. And then some, I think, because they fell to the ground. It was a little bit too much. This is um, our experience that we should pray for. Maybe we'll pray for that tonight, right before we we end. Um, Because I think that being wounded by love, wounded for love, wounded in love, is really what we need. We need to we need something to break us out of our stagnation, our spiritual stagnation, even maybe regression, confusion, wanderings, whatever, weakness. If God would just wound us with his love, then we would be elevated. Like they were on the mountain. And like God wants us to be. Truly, as the brother said earlier, when we experience the communion the body and blood of the Lord Jesus flowing in our veins, we get the opportunity to walk through the window into eternity. But I think we come so weakly prepared that it's a shield to us, and it's a buckler, yes, but it's not the elevation that it could be. It's like when St. Seraphim used to go to the church as a deacon, and he saw the angels hovering over the holy table. That's the man who'd been wounded by love at a relatively young age. But we can be wounded in an old age too, so there's hope for all of us. There's hope that, 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 that God will wound you continually, more even. And for me too, in my hardness of heart, that God will, will wound us. So um, I think we've pretty much got to the peak of the chapter in the first, fifth verse. And we'll basically pray to God that uh, he'll help us to be wounded by love. Be sick with love, right? And desire it. Let's pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we humbly bow before you, understanding how badly we need the experience of being wounded by you. And truly, God, it's not an earthly experience. It's a supernatural, spiritual experience that we need. We crave your presence. We crave to be in this place where we'd even desire, Lord, to be in the banqueting house with your banner over us as love. Might you show us your glory, God, as you showed Peter, and John and James on the mountain, so many of the saints. Might you allow us in a small way to enter in so that we would desire more. This wound that you give us would lead us to eternal life and lead us into your presence. And those around us would be struck by the greatness of your glory in us and those around us. We pray thy blessing be upon us. We 
thank you for the chance to come apart to consider you as the rose, to consider the lilies of the field, to consider the apple tree, but most of all, Lord, to consider being wounded by your love. We pray thy blessing would descend upon our souls for your glory and for our benefit, we pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.